Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Getting Hammered. I'm your host, Mary Catherine Ham. I am here with my co-host, Vic Mattis of the Washington Free Beacon. It's 2024 all day, 24-7, 24, 24, what, 12? It's till the end of this <laughs> campaign. So we're going to be talking all about that, including a lot of video clips of Kamala Harris doing interviews, doing town halls, the things that we have said she should be doing. So she's out there doing them. And there's also some Trump-related October surprises. So we'll talk about those as well. But before we get into all that, how's it going, Vic? Hello, Mary Catherine. Doing just fine. I wanted to mention our good friend Hugh Hewitt was intrigued the last time I was on his show because we were talking about Kamala Harris and her supposedly working at McDonald's and don't you remember the various jobs you did and all the various details, right? right? And he talked about how he can list all of his jobs as a lifeguard and everything else. And then he asked me about what I had done. And I had mentioned that I worked at a Hallmark store. Yeah. And he was absolutely intrigued by that. It's almost like finding somebody who worked at a photomat because mm -hmm. it's like, does that exist anymore? And I looked into it just uh, recently. Hallmark stores do exist. They do. I, I imagine that if they aren't being run out of business because of online greeting cards and people, maybe they don't even send cards anymore. And they, they'll, they'll send a card in the form of a gift card through an email. The print stuff, I imagine that their big competitor is Papyrus. That's where they would go, right? Yeah. That's like the fancy. That is fancy. It is. When I worked, when I worked at a Hallmark, the uh, minimum wage was four twenty five. So that was bad. And isn't it isn't it about four fifty now? Four seventy five? I can't remember what the minimum wage is, but it's about that, right? Okay. And, and my, yeah, we, my we we have aged past that. Slight, yes, it's very telling. And my bosses they they were from Korea, husband and wife. They were Korean store owners. They were very good. He was tough. She was nice. But but then you know you have this idea of what they are and who they are and what they do. And then even, you know, the tough boss, Mr. Yim, after a while, you know, as the summer progressed, he starts to loosen up and he's no longer lecturing me about how to get things done the right way, the wrong way in his way. <laughs> and, and, and I learned that, you know, before he became this small business owner, you know, he, he, he studied business. He went to, he went to college and, and, and learned about business. And then he, he studied in Italy. And he was like in Milan and it was like this wow. whole other world that I had, and, you know, you learn something interesting from all these people is, is the thing. And, and the only thing I hope that he didn't learn was where were all the missing uh, candies going oh. were in my mouth. <laughs> the, there was an inventory problem. Very subtle. Very subtle. The coconut oh, yeah, clusters no. were to die for. It's, it's like a Hallmark the store. Space skimming. You were, you were just skimming. Yeah, just a little bit, just a little bit. And, and, but that was it. And I think the, the, the worst thing. The thing that annoyed me the most was the the hot air balloons, the mylar balloons, because you know, like you got to get it, you know, Heathcliff or Garfield, maybe, Heathcliff, yeah. you know, and you got to and you got to do the ribbons, and you have the scissors, so you do the ribbons. To oh make yeah, the twirls. These like, are important skills. Those are actually good life skills. I don't Twirling know. Twirling a that. ribbon is a yeah. good life skill. Yeah, and and I always found out that the, you know, and the register, of course, you know, has the the ream of paper for the receipts. Mm -hmm. It always ran out when the line was longest. It just never fails. I, that always looked like an unenviable, enviable job to be the person refilling that little. Yeah, piece, that it little never. Is, all, you start seeing the little red streak, yeah. and I'm like, oh no, it's coming up. Yeah. And you know, you'd get there, and then you'd close out the day, and you'd vacuum. It was he ran a tight ship, and 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 they sold also precious moments. You're, of course you know, they this, did. This of course they did. By the way, my kids love a Hallmark store. Oh, they do, huh? Yeah, because oh. it's like all sorts of like kitsch and figurines Kitch. and yes. little stuffed animals. Right. And you get so it. They, cool they enjoy it very much. Okay, Mary Catherine, how are you? I'm good. Uh, you reminded me with your first job stories or yeah. your service industry story me too. Uh, that there's a little update on the McDonald's story, courtesy mm. of Free Beacon reporters who yes. found that the one source other than Kamala's campaign that confirms that she worked at McDonald's, is a person in Canada who heard from her mother that she used to work at McDonald's. Yeah. And that person is also a campaign surrogate, which the New York yes. Times did not disclose in its reporting. So now we're back to one source because every source is the campaign. So just FYI. 
I don't know if it was even worth mentioning that she spoke at the Democratic National Convention. Oh, Is it worth sort of um, mentioning that? Who could have noticed I, this? I don't know. So yeah, a lot of lot of journalistic ethics being that's that's literally it's, it's it's like my my girlfriend lived who lives in Canada. Yeah. Story. That's what this is. Anyway. Oh man, it's a little update there. The also the local branch of or the local franchise of McDonald's has been bombarded with like <sighs> bad behavior, threats, right? Yelp downvoting and terrible reviews, review bombing. I, th- I guess is the term for that. Please, just like it's a small business, guys, in yeah. Pennsylvania. Everyone, chill. I know that right. you can. Okay, so that's the McD's update. But mm. on uh, you reminded me of my first kind of weird job Do in tell. this way when I was a freshman in college. Now I was a babysitter during all of high school. So it's a, it's a pretty sweet gig. Like that's not a hard gig. Did you have um, like regular customers per se? Yeah, so they, I nannied, you were the go-to. I nannied during the summers. At one point as a, as a 14 or 15 year old, I was trusted with one year old twins, which now I look back on and I'm like, was that wise? But I th- look, I did a good job. It made you who you are today. So I was a babysitter, so I didn't have a lot of rough service type gigs in high school. In college, because I knew I was going to have to focus on class, uh, I took a job delivering newspapers to the dorms. Yes, that's that's a popular one. And seven days a week, I got up at 3.30 or 4 to pick up newspapers at a warehouse and deliver the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I was going to I was going to ask you which paper. To yeah. the, to the uh, dorms, because what they needed was a student who had a student ID to get into the dorms to deliver, because they couldn't have their normal yeah. delivery folks do it. The job was not long hours. It was just terrible hours. Yeah, so it for took college about, especially. It, it took about two hours of work per day, maybe. Uh-huh. And I got paid a decent amount because they had to pay me, uh, at the time, I guess, the delivery uh, folks were unionized, mm-hmm. so they had to pay me the union minimum. Yeah. Oh, okay. So even though I didn't get a lot of, I didn't get a lot of hours, I got yeah. paid like more than I should have for the hours. But like I said, they were hardship hours, I would say. But yes, they are. I knew that if I had that job, I wouldn't party because I had to be up at four wow. in the morning. Wow. So I was putting guardrails in for myself. It gave me plenty of money for a poor college yeah. student on that scale to sort of support myself right. And, right. and even sometimes enjoy myself. And, and discipline. Gave me some discipline, and then it got increasingly easier. You know why? Because everybody's professors told them that they had to have a subscription the first semester, and everybody got their subscription and was like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to read the paper. Well-meaning students were like, I'm going to read the paper. Right. By the second semester, nobody renewed. So wow. I ended up with like 20 papers to deliver. This okay, and then, then, then you go back to semester. sleep? Now, a fun thing about this, too, was that I had to do it on – Friday into Saturday morning. So like late, late, late Friday and late, late, late Saturday nights. Uh So I'd come up to the dorm with a cart of heavy, heavy Sunday newspapers. Right. On Saturday at, you know, Saturday or Sunday morning Mm -hmm. at four in the morning. I I think I know where this is going because this was going to be my question, but continue. So I would roll up with my giant cart of very heavy papers, pull in the hand cart up the hill in Athens, go into my dorm. And I would get up there and there'd be a whole crowd, you know, smoking cigarettes oh, outside the door. Okay, yeah. And they'd be like, oh, whoa, man, you deliver papers? That is crazy. Is this your job? Do you do this every day? <laughs> this is like drunk, high yeah. questions about yes. delivering newspapers. And I would just be like, yeah, I do it every day. Yeah, this is how it works. And Occasionally, I would like freak someone out by delivering a paper to a room that clearly smelled like weed, uh, and they would hear something thump on the doorstep, and yes. all run scrambling to like flush things down toilets and throw things out windows. Narks, they were narks. They, they thought I was after him. They thought someone was after him. But anyway, I, I, I it was it was a good job. I, I was going to say, Mary Catherine. I remember like we would get the Washington Post when I was in college and in the dorm. I hated the delivery guys who would swap them against yeah. the door yeah. in the early morning hours. It was such a jolt. I must yeah. say that that is a newspaper delivery person privilege. And like, we're a little resentful <gasps> that we're up at 3.30 yeah. or 4 and oh, doing this right. job. So, and yeah, there might be a little extra oh, zing man. on that paper when it hits the doorstep. 
particularly a weekend edition, man. Yes. The, the, the door is going to shake. Oh, man. Those Sunday papers were huge. Heavy. Yeah, but they, they were, were huge. huge. They were huge. And I, I noticed that with the drunk University of Georgia men, so a lot of the chivalry was out the window. Like, nobody was helping me carry the... We had to push the... They yeah. were just, like, sitting on the benches laughing at me. It was a good time. I, a, I learned a lot. That That, that is... I it started is, from the bottom, now I'm here. Yeah, right. you know what? You've always right. been in journalism. There you go. <laughs> anyway. You so. have always been delivering the news, and here we are. <laughs> I have been. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. Yep. So shall we get to the news? Let's do it. All righty. First, let's do October surprises. Oh, yeah. Okay. Number one. Can I say, I'm not sure an October surprise really exists anymore. Yeah, I mean, to be a level of a true bombshell these days with our news cycle, it, it takes a lot. It, it takes, takes a lot. lot. It would have to be something so incredibly egregious. And by that, I mean yeah. more egregious than the Access mm -hmm. Hollywood tape, okay? that. Yeah. Look, I was one of those who in 2016 was like, well, that's not going to fly. It. He's done. Right. Yeah. Donald Trump, as we know, does not have to adhere to political gravity in the same way that mm -hmm. other people do. And that is just a fact of life. I don't I don't think it's a great fact of life, but it is a fact of life. So the question becomes, is an October surprise really a thing? People have been mm -hmm. voting already. They've already started. So if your October yeah. surprise comes too late, you missed a bunch of people. Right. In this case, we have a story in The Atlantic and a story in The New York Times. They come out around the same time. Yep. The named source in both is the same. Like, pretty clearly, these this whole thing came together in a plan. The Atlantic story is Trump, colon, I need the kind of generals that Hitler had. <laughs> okay, so the New York Times story is, as election nears, Kelly warns Trump would rule like a dictator. John mm -hmm. Kelly, the Trump White House's longest-serving chief of staff, so that he believed that Donald Trump met the definition of a fascist. Okay, so those are the two stories. Let's start with the Atlantic one. One, I want to say, John Kelly was his chief of staff. I appreciated him during that administration being guardrails for yeah. Trump and doing his best to, to keep him with, between the navigational, navigational beacon, beacons. He knows a lot about Trump. He's had a lot of exposure to Trump. I find him to be a basically trustworthy mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And I take him seriously. Yeah. And so I do want to treat these comments seriously. They've also been reported before. Yeah. This So this is not uh, groundbreaking. Now, that doesn't make the comments better. No. No. Right? Here's the thing I think where I diverge. And then we're going to talk about another part of this story, which I think is the bigger, was meant to be the bigger bombshell, but kind of didn't pan out. We're going to mm -hmm. talk about that in a second. Yep. Yep. The John Kelly stuff, again, I've heard it before. It was reported in some books. Sure. I think this is where I diverge from him, which is that I think Donald Trump can say in absolutely insane, vile, terrible things, have bad judgment, and also not be a fascist. Right. That's where I am. Okay. I can make a joke here. And I kind of, well, I'm trying to figure you it out. Can. Let's assume, I can't. Okay. Let's where just, we are. Let's it's assume. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, what else is new? If we are to assume, that Trump made this reference, right? Said, oh, you know, why can't I? I need like, I need like Hitler's generals, right? And if you were just been, if you worked for the Trump campaign, you, of course they're going to deny that he ever said it. But if they had to uh, explain it, one thing they would say, well, I mean, he was talking about the generals, not the staff. You know, he wasn't talking about Goebbels or Borman. Okay. So that was the first thought I had. And, and everything here is, I say this half jokingly, which is when he says Hitler's generals, is he, I, I wondered. First of all, I don't know if he is a military history buff and, and and he knows anything about the generals or if he's just thinking broadly, right? So I'm going to assume that he is not a – I could be wrong, but I'm going to assume he's not a military history buff per se and that when he's thinking about Hitler's generals, he's not thinking generally like brilliant tactician like Erwin Rommel right. who was forced to kill himself connected to after, you know, the plot to kill Hitler, right? Right. I, I, th I think, I, I, or like Manstein or whoever, I, I think in his mind when he says Hitler's generals, I think he's thinking, and probably doesn't know who these people are, but like Wilhelm Keitel, Alfred Yodel, the suck-ups. I think yeah. what he means yeah. is he wants the correct. generals who will just say, you know, 
yes to whatever he wants to get done, done. I think that's what he means by that. Anyway, I was just figuring this out in my head. None of this is good, by the way. None of this you is know, good. It's But the way that Trump operates, it is yeah. hard to know exactly what he means. He's deciphering. I yeah. think also yeah. once Hitler is brought into the conversation, well, it becomes hard for people to <laughs> yes. parse. Right. Right. But, because I think the lesson probably is he wants yes men generals yeah, and that's, that's right. not what you that's want right. your president to want. Right. And 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 then I mean you know if you watch the if you you know watch those clips from the great movie Downfall which has now become a meme because they always put the different yeah. subtitles in there, you know, in the original and it is based on on truth. You know, he he basically wanted to kill all his generals at the end anyway. They were all unreliable. They all let him down. And here we are. Maybe yeah. he meant the generals that wanted to kill. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's, you know? No, it's so... I, it's so, it's, but I, don't, the, I don't want to joke about it. And no, I know. we have I to know. joke about it because we live in a ridiculous yeah. news cycle. But I think once once Hitler's in the conversation, it comes it becomes very hard for people to parse what they're supposed to take from this other right. than right. Trump is Hitler. It is, and, and I will say it's one of his. It is one of his worst traits mm -hmm. to look at strong men mm -hmm. and say, "Gee, their job looks easier than mm -hmm. mine." This would right. that would that right. that's enviable. No, we don't want that. I'd also note that at times Obama said in public, like it sure is neat how the Chinese don't have to. Oh, sure. Make consensus, Excellent. right? Yeah. This is not a Excellent for point. for for frustrated presidents. Yeah. It's not totally foreign to right. have those thoughts. I don't like it when they say them and express it's them. Also, it's also worth noting that, you know, the whole idea of Trump is a Nazi. Let's say, you know, he's he's like as in as in he believes, uh, he, you know, in, in all the Nazi tenets. It's worth uh, remembering his daughter and son-in-law are Jewish, well, you know, and, also and that somebody, he's and he's somebody, a friend of Israel. You know, I mean, this is so let's. Take a step back here. Well, Although, someone, of course, now the argument is that Israel is the new Nazi Germany. So maybe well, we've come full circle. Of course. Someone tweeted, you know, it, Hitler moved the the embassy to Jerusalem, right? <laughs> the new Hitler, the orange Hitler. Right, and right, they also right. tweeted the picture of him at the at the grave of the Chabad Rebbe and said, worst Nazi ever. I mean, there are. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I've seen that. He too. contains many contradictions. So there's that part of the story, mm -hmm. again, which has been reported in the past. We're doing it again now because it's two weeks before an election. Right. Take from it what you will. Right. Then we have the other story in the Atlantic piece, which takes up a very large part of this piece. And I think was meant to be the October surprise, but it kind of fell apart on them. Mm -hmm. Here's what the allegation is. That Trump spoke badly of a slain female soldier killed at Fort Hood by a fellow soldier. And her family came to Washington to try to get a bill passed and talked about the funeral costs for burying their their family member. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll cover the costs of that and had this nice meeting with them for 20 minutes and backed this, tried to help with this legislation to some degree. And then the the word is that on the after this meeting, I guess when, maybe when the bill came due, he allegedly said while he was in a room with several people that. He complained about the cost of the funeral and how it couldn't possibly cost that much to bury a, I believe the term was effing Mexican. Supposedly. Okay. okay. So that's the allegation. Yeah. yeah. The people in the room have come out and put their names on denials. Yeah. On the record. That this happened. Mark Meadows, who was in the room, his staffer denied it to the Atlantic via text and The Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg turned an un unequivocal denial into an equivocal denial when he put it in the piece. So yeah. it makes it sound like it might have happened. The only source for this is one anonymous source. I believe there are now three people saying, no, this did not happen. Yeah. And their names are on the record. And then the family came out, mm -hmm. In particular, the sister of this slain soldier and said, hey, he was really good to us. I don't really support my sister's death being politicized. I actually voted for Trump. Yeah, that was the real kicker. That, yeah. So now you've got the Gold Star family saying, actually, our treatment was quite good. And you've got Goldberg going on TV and saying, you know, I understand that they have feelings about this, but the truth must be told. And the truth that is most important is my one anonymous source who won't put his name on this report. 
Right. Question, Vic. You're an yes. editor. I de delivered newspapers and have a journalism degree. <laughs> Could you get a similarly sourced hit on Kamala Harris? Excuse me, Kamala Harris placed at any publication. Based on? Based on one unnamed source. Highly unlikely, Mary Catherine. Highly, Highly unlikely. unlikely. It's that stand Again. Do you think um, if I took it to the Atlantic, they'd take it? Yeah. I I'm reminded, you know, in a similar fashion, not to, just on a ta brief tangent here about the Doug Emhoff story. Yeah. You know, oh, and the yeah. Allegation and, and, the, and the woman who is now directly still unnamed, but directly going to, I guess it's the Daily Mail or I forget which publication it is and saying, yeah, he did this to me. And it's not getting any traction and nobody wants to discuss it. And they're still going to continue to make jokes yeah. about Doug Emhoff as being this sort of folksy, you know, husband, cool, and even in some ways sexy in his own way. By husband. the way, Scott Jennings on CNN mentioned oh boy. these allegations against Emhoff the other day. And he was shut down I on bet. air yeah. that he's not allowed to talk about that, despite right. the fact that the number of sources, although unnamed, is quadruple the number yeah. in this case. Exactly. And they have physical receipts, pictures, mm -hmm. right. proof that they were in the same place. That's so right. That's the right. standards are just different right. Yeah. for depending on who the story is bashing. And I am getting a little sick of this thing where Gold Star families only matter if they're saying things the press wants them to say. Yeah, otherwise they'll be ignored. Or, because I think Kazir yeah. Khan should matter when Trump mm -hmm. is trashing him. Right. I think that the Abby Gate families yeah. should matter. When he goes to Arlington and Kamala trashes him for going to Arlington and mm -hmm. then the families say, hey, we appreciated him coming to Arlington. Right. I think that the family of this veteran should matter when they say, hey, this wasn't really our experience. But there's only one kind that matters to the press. Yeah, that's right. And not only that, but, uh, you know, they've doubled down on that story. And so even though this was the you said this was the sister of the fallen soldier. Yeah. Yes. And she said that, you know, that was in her experience. And also she voted for Trump. They really pushed back hard. And some people like George Conway, you know, yeah. are so driven by the derangement syndrome to, you know, say it's so, you know, it, she's not the point of the story. It's about Trump saying these things and, you know, you're basically saying that she was pretty obtuse not to see that. And yeah, I, I just think you if you're going to go there. <laughs> If you're going to claim that you have moral authority instead of the Gold Star family, yeah, don't. You better you better have it real solid. It's, like it's I, I a bad idea. I understand if you think that this this truth must get out to voters, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Have it with several sources on the record. This is why right. I give more credence to the Kelly stuff because his name is right. on it. Whoever this other person is has not put their name on. By the way, the Kelly stuff should still have another source by traditional right. journalistic standards. Just because that's how you do business, right. or it used to be. You got to try to back it up. You have to back it up. And I always, I used to say this on CNN all the time. Just because you can imagine that Trump did something terrible, that mm -hmm. does not absolve you from having to show that he did the thing with the normal rules that yeah. we have. But that's actually not how they operate. They don't use the right. normal rules. And this yeah. piece didn't use the normal rules. No. And I could pitch something similar to the Atlantic and I would get told, are you crazy? Right. No, as I mean, long as it was about Kamala Harris. The fact checking would be so rigorous on that for you. I've been uh, fact checked by the yeah. Atlantic and it is very rigorous, but I guess yeah. this one just got like a pass. By the way, the Atlantic is owned by a very close friend. Uh, yes. And donor of Kamala Harris. And Lauren Powell Jones, Steve Jobs's widow, right? She uh, is the, yes. you know, connected and she's to a, the Atlantic as she's well. She's a backer. She's yeah. a backer. The, but this is all part of, you know, with less than two weeks to go in this election, it's part of this media meltdown that's started slowly, but I think it's it's picking up the picking up speed here. You have these stories that are coming out, and everybody seems to be jumping on this bandwagon. The new thing is Trump is a fascist, right? I mean, this is what they're saying. They tried, um, they tried that he was mentally unstable, they tried he was weird, and 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 that he is, of course, now the other thing is he's senile coming from the same people who defended Joe Biden forever and to well, this just, day. It just feels like too many things, doesn't yeah. it? Well, I, I, it, too many things and trying to see what sticks. I saw a clip of Jimmy Kimmel, you know, 
saying that, you know, Trump is our dumbest president, you know, presidential, you know, candidate ever. And he's a dumb dictator. Well, we're going to you know? test that notion when we go through these Kamala Harris clips. But yeah, I just it just feels like overdoing it at this point. It feels like they don't have a closing argument. It feels like when asked, they can't really offer anything other than he's dangerous, which yeah. look, a lot of people believe. And I have believed at times, right? Like, this right. Is like, yeah, but it's also something he is the most well-defined political figure maybe in our history. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that going back to this well two weeks before the election no. is particularly effective for the people they need to bring. I, I talked about uh, in, in a previous episode the whiff of desperation. The whiff is now a full-on air yeah. of desperation. It's like this current that is going through. And even Joe Biden was, you know, talking, I think he was in New Hampshire. And yeah. he said that they needed to lock him up. And then immediately people started to clap. And then he had to dial it back and said, politically, I mean, politically. Yeah. Actually, this what is, this is where they what, are. That's literally what they've been attempting to do is politically yeah. lock him up. Yeah. <laughs> for them to yeah. Here. I mean, particularly the New York case is like, yeah, we created a felony for you. And then we're going to try to lock you up. Yeah. At any rate. I don't know that it's going to work, but this is the attempt. And I, I also just think journalists should do better sourcing than this. Do a, right. do a better job. And really quickly, Mary Catherine, you talk about, you know, what is her closing message and, and, you know, trying to throw everything, anything on the wall and seeing what sticks. She is going to have a closing message, which is, I think, by the time we you, you hear, we hear the episode, it's, it already has happened, which is on the mall, on the National Mall, right? She's giving a, or maybe that's that's later, but she is speaking on the National Mall, a, a big event, and, and that's going to be it. She also spoke at the residence this week. Yes. Addressing the October surprise story. I guess right. this was supposed to be like a big moment for her. And once again, foiled by her own seeming lack of preparation, yeah. she went out in front of the residence, which was, I was had the seal on the podium. It was to look very official. Official. You know, because so many storied addresses have happened from the Naval Observatory. Yeah. Somebody can correct me. I'm sure there are some important addresses at some point. But she comes out. She hasn't apparently read the thing she's going to say. It's very rocky. We can play a little clip of it because we're going to torture reading. you with a lot of these clips today. We can play a little clip of that. Okay. It is deeply troubling and incredibly dangerous that Donald Trump would invoke Adolf Hitler, the man who is responsible for the deaths of six million Jews and hundreds of thousands of Americans. Again, if you're going to take the October surprise story and make it your moment, make it your moment. That's right. The, uh, the announcing, by the way, that Trump is a fascist, while at the same time you have Democratic senators like Bob Casey in Pennsylvania and Tammy Baldwin in Wisconsin, running ads that show how they cooperated and worked with Trump to get legislation done, you know, reaching across the aisle. But that kind of goes in the face of the Trump is a fascist argument. You since, know, I'm going to reach across the aisle and also get rid of the filibuster and yeah. also call him a fascist. And how, how do they feel about that? So yeah. clearly, and I, again, clearly that, that tells me that internals in Pennsylvania and in Wisconsin are, are not good for her. And otherwise they wouldn't be running these ads. Where, where you see Donald Trump in a Democratic ad, that's, that's insane. So, yeah, that that is again, pretty, they're just trying to see what sticks again. Uh, and here's the thing <laughs> I always warn. They could just be freaking out because they're neurotic. Yeah, uh, they actually, I think, do have generally recognized better tools and organization for getting even enthusiastic voters to the polls. Yeah. Now, some of the early voting numbers show that Republicans have at least changed their behavior in places like North Carolina, Nevada. Yeah. Nevada in particular is showing oh my a lot of a lot of rural voters coming yeah. in early. Now, the question is, do you cannibalize your day of? Right. What does that mean? Does that mean in addition to everybody right. who traditionally votes Republican on Election Day? Because, you know, again, the, the Election Day voters uh, generally favor Republicans. Or are these the very same Republican voters who are now just voting early? Right. So we don't um, know. We, until, we don't know. But no. Democrats often count on that edge before yep. Election Day so that they don't have Republicans have to overcome a lot on election That's day. Right. So if they have less to overcome, then they're in a good position. That's right. And in and in Nevada, 
the, those numbers show that there are now more Republicans who have voted early than Democrats, something by 8,000. Yeah. It's it's a real edge out there. And John it's Ralston curious. is quite an That's expert right. in it. So he's, he's been keeping track. Okay. Can we do Kamala clips? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. We, talk, we talked about Trump, his bad news stories, such that they are, again, mm. I just want them better sourced. Right. I, I, That's it. If you're going to make the big splashy claim in October... You need to have named sources and you need to have several of them. Yeah. All right. She went two places, actually three places this week. So appreciate that she's doing this. I think she should have done it much earlier. And then her mess ups would have happened earlier and then she could have corrected. Right. But the question is, can she correct? And we will hear a little bit about that. Should I do the Halle Jackson clips first? Let's let's. Yeah, that was earlier. in the That was earlier. Let's 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 go to Halle Jackson. Interesting things. Halle Jackson of NBC interviewing her. And she asks about religious exemptions on abortion because she's saying, OK, well, how do you get people like Murkowski and and Maine senator whose name is terribly escaping me right now? She's asking about ex- exemptions on abortion for religious belief mm-hmm. and how you would get someone like a Murkowski or a Susan Collins on board because they are more moderate on this issue. That's right. How do you protect them, basically, from the very extreme view of abortion in the Democratic Party? Here's what Kamala Harris had to say. What concessions would be on the table? Religious exemptions, for example? Is that something that you would consider? I don't think we should be making concessions when we're talking about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. To Republicans like, for example, uh, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, who would back something like this on a Democratic agenda if, in fact, Republicans control Congress, would you offer them an olive branch? Or is that off the table? Is that not an option for you? I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals. So shall we walk through that a little bit, Yeah, yeah, please. It's actually... Very radical, what she's saying. What she's saying is that abortion is a fundamental freedom, Mm -hmm. but that religious liberty is is not. not. And that by virtue of being a doctor or an insurer or an employer or Mm -hmm. a hospital, one would necessarily give abortion care Mm -hmm. regardless of how your religion views abortion. I think we've had for some time known Harris's opinion on religion. I know that she says that she prays every day, sometimes twice, and she said faith is a verb. But besides that, yes, you got you got to faith it, Mary Catherine. You got to faith it. Faith in it away. Yes, yeah. but but the the idea of basically after your conscience is is as you said, it's radical. It, it, that would make her the most clearly the most liberal, the most progressive candidate for president nominee that that they've ever had you, you go back into the 90s again with the clintons but bill clinton and and the idea of abortion being safe legal and rare and and you have and that is a world away and here we are saying that there you know she would not support religious exemptions which again is uh, elevating as scott johnson and others uh, uh, pointed out you're you're elevating a statutory right over a constitutional right so well, whatever, if it trumps so, the Constitution, that's fine. So that's what strikes but me about not. it is that she, okay, th- there are people like Jonathan Martin, who's a mm-hmm. reporter at Politico, who will tell you she's just a mercenary who wants to win. She's not really ideological. Mm-hmm. She's willing to buck her own side. She doesn't really believe all this liberal stuff that she said she believed in 2019. Uh-huh. Okay. I think what she is, I don't, I don't know that she's particularly ideological or has a lot of really strongly held mm-hmm. beliefs. I do know that the one thing she speaks about somewhat eloquently is abortion. Abortion, yeah. I think that she is a default California liberal. Yeah. And a default California liberal does believe that the statutory protections of something like abortion are a fundamental freedom, but religious freedom, which is in the actual Constitution, yeah. is not. These yeah. are They're not used to balancing such things against each other or having any idea that it might be crazy to say that she won't be balancing them. Yeah. I mean, that is, it's a shocking admission, but I don't think she knows it's shocking because she's been a California liberal her whole life. That's right. It, 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 it's, and it's, it, it's, it, it's not a surprise in the sense that if you can, again, go back to when she was on the uh, Judiciary Committee and Judge Brian Bocher was going, getting confirmed, and she asks him about his affiliation with the Knights of Columbus. Oh, yeah. And she makes it sound like he was, you know, part of the People's Temple or something, you know, like a cult. 
and that this weird cult that happens to think of traditional the traditional definition of marriage between a man and a woman and that women don't have a right to choose and and that you know who would have an abortion and 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 who would think that yeah and it's like uh, you know that's where she's coming from yes and, and so i mean that just you know surfaced in the hallie jackson interview and it, this is a pattern by the way that her <laughs> obliviousness to the answers coming out of her mouth and how they might play is quite yeah. shocking to me. Yeah. Let me play another one from her. This is Hallie Jackson pressing her about Biden's condition. Oh. You have made it clear that you believe this is a binary choice between you and Donald Trump. That, that's well, those it, are the candidates on the ballot. There's of course, only of course. two choices. Yes, but, yes. And I know that Joe Biden is not on the ballot. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But the reason that you are at the top of the ticket is because he dropped out of this race. And so I want to ask you, um, and, and it was largely because of that debate performance back in June. You defended him in the days before and in the days after as you were campaigning for another four years for President Biden. Can you say that you were honest with the American people about what you saw in those moments with President Biden as you were with him again and again repeatedly in that time? Of course. Joe Biden is a, an extremely accomplished, um, experienced, and, um, and, and capable in every way that anyone would want if they're president. And you Absolutely. never saw anything like what happened at the debate night behind closed doors with him? It was a bad debate. People have bad debates. Should he? That, he is absolutely. But that's the reason why you're here, and he's not running for the top of the ticket. Well, you'd have to ask him if that's the only reason why. What do you think? I am running for president of the United States. Joe Biden is not. And my presidency will be about bringing a new generation of leadership to America that is focused on the work that we need to do to invest in the ambitions and aspirations of the American people. It's a judgment question. That's why I ask. Can the American people trust you in these moments, even when it's maybe uncomfortable for Americans to, to have, to, to level with Americans in that way? So that's why I ask. And it sounds like what you're saying is you feel like you never saw anything like that from President Biden. I have time. worked with Joe Biden, whether it, hours and hours and hours over these four years, whether it be in the Situation Room or the Oval Office. Joe Biden is the one who was able to bring NATO together during a crisis where, for the first time in 70 years, Europe saw and has seen war. Joe Biden has done the work that has been about being a leader on what we have done to fix so much of what has been broken in terms of the economy because of Donald Trump's mismanagement. I speak with not only sincerity, but with a, 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 a real firsthand account of watching him do this work. I have no reluctance in saying that. No, of course I don't. It goes on for a bit. I think it's important for you to hear a reporter actually press yeah, her on this. this I would, is, okay, I can, prop, props to Hallie Jackson and yes. several times uh, in that interview, she actually says to the vice president, I, I don't think you were clear in yes. trying to give her a, a, another attempt to clarify. But of course, she doesn't clarify. She just evades. She cannot answer a lot of these questions directly. She doesn't want to. And in the Joe Biden case, I mean, you know, I understand. I'm sympathetic that she is put in a very difficult position. There's not a great answer here. No, there's not, because she cannot say the truth, which is, oh, yeah, I've known that he was not well for a long time. And then we really had to put the screws to him. And then we forced him out. And that's why I'm here today. So I've known for some time. And, you know, we were just waiting for him to, uh, you know, make a decision on it. And then after he made the wrong decision, we made him make the right decision. I mean, that's the that's like the answer that we want, you know, but but well, at yeah, some point. Yeah. The, her choices are, are either I'm oblivious yeah. Or I was part of the cover up, and right. neither one is a good choice. The the oblivious one is also interesting because at some point with the clip you just played, she starts to sort of trail off, and I start thinking that she's going to turn into again Frankie Five Angels from The Godfather too, and be like, I don't know no Godfather. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like what? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you so know. this is the sec This is only the second time she's been asked this question. Once by Brett, yeah. once by uh, yeah. Hallie, who again yeah, I think her tone her. is great. She pushes very yeah. professionally mm -hmm. she gets to the heart of the thing which is but then why do you, why are you here <laughs> she why well again i maybe maybe she thought she was uh gonna be on instead with joy reed you yeah. know it should have been joy reed stick to joy reed lawrence so, o'donnell is it lawrence o'donnell on, on yeah. msnbc yeah or the view and that's it yeah you know? well and it, and again you know this question's coming 
Yeah. You know okay. the question's coming. Okay, so that's a pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Let's let's go into the town hall at CNN. Okay. She has this week taken two days off the trail. Yes. To prepare for interviews. Um, Big town she, hall. She Got a prepared for this CNN town hall last night where she was asked questions by audience members and then Anderson Cooper did follow up. And once again, I'm going to say about the reporter, I don't know what the sea change is here. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was Bill Whitaker and then Brett asking tough questions that they realized, oh, maybe we should do that too. But Anderson Cooper's asking simple, direct. Yeah. And this is not a knock on him predictable questions of her yeah. that she nonetheless cannot answer. So let's let's play a little bit about the border. This is an exchange with Anderson Cooper last night. 2022, 2023, sure. there were record border crossings. You, your administration took a number, hundreds of executive actions. It didn't stem the flow. Numbers kept going up. Finally, in 2024, uh, just in June, three weeks before the, last, the first presidential debate with Joe Biden, uh, you institute executive actions that had a dramatic impact, really shut down people crossing over. Why didn't your administration do that in 2022, 2023? First of all, you're exactly right, Anderson. And as of today, we have cut the flow of immigration by over half. In fact, the numbers I saw most recently, mm -hmm. illegal immigration. But if is it was low that easy on, with that finish. executive me... action, why not do it in 2022, well, 2023? Because we were working with Congress and hoping that actually we could have a long-term fix to the problem instead of a short-term fix. You couldn't have done one and the, both at the same time? Well, here's the thing. I, we have to understand that ultimately this problem is going to be fixed through congressional action. So, oh, By the way, just a edit this out, Jennifer, but that ding you hear is that on my old computer, I cannot turn off my notifications. So we'll when we put the clips in, we don't have to have that part. He asks her the question that makes yeah. sense, which is why why couldn't you do both? Why were you taking executive action so late? You could have done it earlier. You could have not even not reversed Trump's executive actions. She can't answer it. I understand that she had a very truncated campaign. And she was thrown into this when yes. Biden finally stepped down. There are only two weeks, less than two weeks now left until this election. Next week is it. You would think, though, that by this point, she would have a better answer on the border. They put themselves in this position because, again, it's very easy for the Republicans to point out, you know, they, you know, Joe Biden comes into office with Kamala Harris and they reverse something like 94 executive decisions on the border. And suddenly you went from like 2.6 million illegals to 8 million, 9 million, and more than 11,000 convicted murders. It's a disaster. And, and then you, in addition to that, you know, you, you would think that the people who are training her would say, okay, now when this comes up, you're going to say, well, Donald Trump told people to vote down the Republican bill that was, you know, a very cons backed by serious conservatives. So it's his fault. And then you would say to your boss, your, the candidate, Okay. And then they're going to say, okay, but that just happened like a couple months ago. What about the first three and a half months? What is your, what is your answer? Okay. Well, and to that point, let me play another clip for you. Oh, and man. guys, this is about a two minute clip and yeah. I'm sorry, you are going to have to cringe through it with me. This is amazing. <laughs> but she's asked about the wall. Yeah. And she's asked about the this wall because this piece of legislation she's mm -hmm. pushing has wall funding in it. But what has she said about the wall? un-American, against our values, stupid. Okay, so Anderson has some questions about that. Is a border wall stupid? Well, let's talk about Donald Trump and that border wall. <laughs> so remember Donald Trump said Mexico would pay for it? Come on, they didn't. How much of that wall did he build? I think the last number I saw is about 2%. And then when it came time for him to do a photo op, you know where he did it? In the part of the wall that President Obama built. But you're agreeing so, to a bill on. that would earmark $650 million <laughs> to continue building that we, wall. I, I pledge that I am going to bring forward that bipartisan bill to further strengthen and secure our border. Yes, I am. But, and I'm going to work across the aisle to pass com a comprehensive bill that deals with a broken immigration system. I think Jackson's question, part of it was to acknowledge that America has always had migration, but there needs to be a legal process for it. People have to earn it. And that's the point that I think is the most important point that can be made, which is we need a president 
yeah. who is grounded in common sense and practical outcomes. Like, let's just fix this thing. Mm. Let's just fix it. Why is there any ideological perspective on this? It's going to keep going, and I'm just yeah. continuing to apologize to you guys, but you got to hear it. Let's just fix the problem. If, if, to fix the problem, you're, you're doing this compromise bill. It does call for $650 million that was earmarked under Trump to actually still go to build the wall. I am not afraid of good ideas where they occur. You know, so you don't think it's stupid anymore? I think what he did and how he did it did, was, did not make much sense because he actually didn't do much of anything. I just talk, talked about that wall, right? We just talked about it. He didn't actually do much of anything. But you do want to build some wall. I want to strengthen our border. And scene. Okay, so I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Uh I think that I'm not afraid of a good idea no matter where it comes from. Yeah, okay. Good line. Couple points there. Sure. I think that's a good line. Uh The rest of this thing is a total mess. Right. Her her problem, of course, is how that she's been quoted as saying this is a stupid idea or that that, it's medieval, right? I mean, and it's not going to stem the tide. And yet here she is. I really think that that town hall reached for her rock bottom when Anderson Cooper said, so you don't think it's stupid anymore. And because that's the word she she used. Yeah. And I thought I thought for certain she was going to say, you know what's stupid? Your question, you know, or something like that. I, I, because she, she looked like she was like going to say Donald Trump is stupid. That's what I'm going to well, you know, and just like, oh, there is gosh, a tendency she is has. Awful. There is a tendency she has, and you can see it when she she makes her quote unquote joke about. Remember how you said they were going to pay for the wall, right. which is a fair hit. Yeah. It was crazy and dumb yeah. for him to say yeah, that Mexico, Mexico going to pay for the wall. For it. It's a hit that doesn't land, mm-hmm. beca- partly because she's her, mm-hmm. and partly because she's doing the thing she did with Brett, which is we're on the same side here, right? right? Like, like, don't you right. just understand what I'm saying? Let's finish each other's sentences, and the crowd is like. No, we're not on your side yet. You that have, was what's you have shocking. to answer the question. Right. So this was not, you know, this is not a rally. So when she turns to the audience, says, remember this, remember, remember when he said Mexico would pay for the wall. It's it's awkward because you don't see the audience, but what you hear is silence. Dead silence. Dead silence. And, then, and, so, and then she says the thing, this is another thing she does. She says, We just talked about that wall. That's her tell what, that the card. That mean? The cards in her head are finished. Yeah. She has nothing else yeah. on this subject, and she yeah. wants to wrap it up, and she wants your help to wrap it up. And Anderson Cooper is not giving her the help no. that she's asking for. And and, she, and 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 that laughter, that nervous laughter came back, which tells me that this was true panic mode. Now, we know Mary Catherine from people who used to work for her and who have been interviewed who say that, you know, her problem is that she's lazy and what more specifically is she doesn't like the briefings yeah and then she goes into a situation like this like this this happened i guess originally with lester holt on nbc and then after you know the fiasco happens she then chews out her staff for not being briefed right so it's a lose-lose if you work for her which explains why i think over several years the turnover rate of her staff is 94 percent. I mean, I think we have two of the most uncoachable candidates who have ever existed, yeah. Yeah. maybe Against in each Trump other. and Kamala yeah. Harris. I yeah, want to roll through a couple more of these clips. So this is this is her answering a college student. You ready for this one uh-huh. uh, again on the border? Yeah. Regarding the rapid increase in the migrant population, how will you ensure that every immigrant is integrated into American society safely? What benefits and subsidies will you provide them with? And how long will these benefits and subsidies last for an individual? Most importantly, will the American citizens' taxes pay for these benefits and subsidies? And if so, how much money, how much money will be allocated? Well, thank you, Jackson. Let's start with this. America's immigration system is broken, and it needs to be fixed. And it's been broken for a long time. And part of what we need to do is always prioritize what we need to do to strengthen our border. I will tell you I'm the only person In this race, among the two choices that voters have, I've personally prosecuted transnational criminal organizations in the trafficking of guns, drugs, and human beings. I have spent a significant part of my career making sure that our border is secure and that we do not allow criminals in and we don't allow that kind of trafficking to happen and come into our country. And as as my opponent has proven himself. He would prefer to run on the problem instead of fix the problem. 
cool. That didn't answer that at all. <laughs> I, I my favorite line, by the way, is what we need to do is what we need to do. Okay. Yeah. So here's here she is on actually Telemundo, same day. Mm -hmm. And he's asking, this reporter is asking from a different position about a path to citizenship and like yes. I, I just just witness this one. Hold on. Right now we're talking about border security and there's nobody, no Democrat talking about a pathway to citizenship, uh, an immigration relief am, and the, the I am talking benefits about that migrants bring to this country. Oh, but there's no question that migrants bring, but America is a country that is, it was built in part by immigrants who have But people are concerned about their TPS, their DACA, their um, we're talking about uh, mass deportations. I'm not talking about. What do you stand on mass deportations? You, what's what's your stand mm. there? This, uh, we need smart, humane immigration policy in America mm -hmm. that includes a pathway to citizenship. <laughs> this man, this man is like English is my second language, and I need you to do better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, you know, I liked his accent, by the way. <laughs> uh, he's great at speaking. My name is Inigo Montoya. Prepare to die. So, yeah, that's a problem. And she's been doing this again for some time. I don't know what, where, where, where she goes from here. It's not, it's, it's not good. And again, she, the staffers, are, the staffers are paying a heavy price for this. You know, at this moment in time, whoever's idea it was to go on any of these shows are getting chewed out. Unless somebody is trying to tell her that she's amazing and she's surrounded herself by a lot of yes people. I mean, that, that uh, may, I don't know if she has any left, but yeah. the thing is, she may very well win. I mean, this is like a 50-50-ish sure. race. Yeah, uh, USA so Today still has her up by a point or two. Right. You know? I think it's important to know, for instance, I know I'm torturing you guys, but she doesn't have one legislative priority. You ready oh. for this one? This is a... Central casting Kamala voter asking yes. her this question. Yes. A Swarthmore political prof science professor. Right. In a cardigan and some funky reading yeah, glasses. Full okay. Deal, straight out of. And she Central says, casting. like, I'm trying to help you out. Here's my question. Yo. And just just hear what Harris has for her. A uh, political science professor at Swarthmore College. She's a registered Democrat who says she's leaning toward voting for you, has yet to make her final decision. Carol? Hi, Carol. Thank Good you. evening. Uh, thank Good you evening. for visiting us in Delaware County, um, Vice President Harris. My question is this. If you could accomplish only one major policy goal that required congressional action, what would it be and why? Well, there's not just one. I have to be honest with you, Carol. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to happen, but let's let's I think that maybe part of this point that I how I think about it is we've got to get past this era of politics and partisan politics, slowing down what we need to do in terms of progress in our country. And that means working across the aisle. I've done that before. We did it around whether it be what we were able to accomplish with the bike partisan infrastructure deal, or some of the work that we have done in terms of dealing with gun safety. But we've got to... It goes on for another minute like that. <laughs> Spoiler alert, there's no legislative... She doesn't mention anything. Yeah. Like, you get like, one shot, by the way. No, you, this is like the genie get grants you three wishes. What are they? You know, and, and, and here you go. You can say it now. National right to abortion. And... Well, and the, the woman yeah. who wants to vote for her... Got, yeah. Like oh the look on her face is looking the look at her of like, disappointment. Like please give me something, please give me something. This is her trying to think of a mistake she's made. Oh of. yeah, this is my this is one of my favorite ones. The weakness question. Here we go. And I want to say because I don't want to be totally mm -hmm. unfair to her. She looks fantastic. So just mm -hmm. okay. And I did say she had that one good line. Okay. Is there something you can point to in your life, political life, or in your life in the last four years that you think is a mistake that you have learned from? I mean, I've I, I've made many mistakes, um, and they range from you know, <laughs> if you've ever parented a child, you know you make lots of mistakes too. Um, in my role as vice president, I mean, I've probably worked very hard at making sure that um, I am well versed on issues and. Um, I think that is very important. It's a mistake not to be well-versed on an issue and feel compelled to answer a question. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that mm -hmm from Anderson? Mm -hmm. He also is looking her at her like, give me something. 
she's not well versed on issues. That's one of the problems. Mm -hmm. And she mentions no mistake. You know, I was reminded of back in the day after the after after the end of the first Clinton year, so 1993 to 1994. Clinton was asked in an interview about asked a similar question regarding a low point, and the first thing he said was Black Hawk Down and the death of 18 U.S. Rangers, which is why they fired Les Aspen, the Secretary of Defense. Right. You know. <laughs> It's certainly not his fault. But definitely but, not. No. Hey, look, but, firing anybody would be an improvement on what we yeah, have right well, now. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to say. He also tried to, you know, blame it on his national security advisor at the time, Tony Lake. But the point is, he came up with a low point, and that was, yeah. you know, and in terms of at least foreign policy and military, that was a real low point, you know, with Black Hawk Down incident. So she, in her mind, she's like, I cannot admit, must not admit. Again, you would think, you would think that, you know, her mentor was Trump's mentor, you right. know, Roy Cohen, you know, right. like, don't admit any mistakes. So, well, it, it's a bad tendency. I think it would do her good to just pick something. Yeah. Oh, I have to go to other events because my schedule is crazy. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, but I'm going to play. I'm going to play the weakness one, one. The weakness. What's your greatest so, weakness? The one she says. Yeah. OK, we'll do two more real quick. Thank this you. This was mixed with Michael Scott, so okay, enjoy. Yes. Oh, good. This is her answering, good. what's her weakness? What weaknesses do you bring to the table, and how do you plan to overcome them while you're in office? That's a great question, Joe. Um, well, I am certainly not perfect, <laughs> so let's start there. And um, I think that I – perhaps a weakness, some would say, but I actually think it's a strength, is I really do value – having a team of very smart people around me who bring to my de decision-making process different perspectives. I, um, my team will tell you I am constantly saying, let's kick the tire on that. Let's kick the tires on it. Okay, and then one okay, last it's beyond. one. beyond. It is beyond. One last one. She wants to do all this compromising. She also calls Trump a fascist. She also, it turns out, wants to get rid of the filibuster. But there's a little, there's a little wrinkle in this plan. You ready for this one? Let, let me ask you. You've talked about codifying Roe v. Wade. That would obviously require 60 votes in in the Senate, a, a majority a, of the House. That's a big, that's a big leap. You don't, we don't have that yet. If that's not possible to codify it in the House, what do you do? I think we need to take a look at the filibuster, to be honest with you. But Civics quiz, Vic. Yeah, is there the a filibuster in the House? No, there's not. She's, 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 she's reaching back to her Senate roots is what she's thinking. And as you know, she was uh, a senator. And no. that's what came to mind. Again, she's she never had the, the talking house. point. The talking mm -hmm. point is that she's going to destroy the only norm we have yeah. left that requires working across yeah. the aisle. And it has nothing to do with the House. So I, there I you want, go. Here's the I, plan. I would I would like to revisit this when what if and when Trump wins if they still want to you know do away with the filibuster. Mm -hmm. we'll see. I think that's conditional. Okay, Vic. Mary Catherine, you have a heart out. I do. I got to go. This will wrap up. Help, Nick. I will wrap it up. This is this episode of Getting Hammered. Remember, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube, and you can follow me on Twitter at Victorina Mattis. I'm at MK Hammer on Twitter at MK Hammer Time on Instagram. You can follow the show at Getting Hammered Podcast on YouTube. And Instagram, thank you so much for getting hammered responsibly. I regret that I had to do those long clips for you, but we do what we must. Yes. This has been a Nebulous Video Podcast. <laughs>